Good evening, I'm Dana Moore, an AARP volunteer, and you're in for an enlightening session with AARP Kentucky and the Kentucky Historical Society. Hello, I'm Carol Bolton Easterly. I'm the Museum Programs Coordinator for the Kentucky Historical Society. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for the first session in a three-part series. AARP Kentucky is bringing you this lifelong learning series to help you explore new things and learn about various topics meaningful to people 50 plus. We are grateful to have the Kentucky Historical Society with us tonight to take us back to some significant moments in the Commonwealth's history. We'll be remembering Kentucky in the 1960s. This series is part of AARP Kentucky's lifelong learning initiative AARP Kentucky Comebackers, which provides information and resources to help you explore your options to continue learning throughout life. Life can get in the way and post-secondary education can be costly, but there are programs available to Kentucky adults who want to make their comeback and seek education. It's never too late. AARP is here for you to find your next learning path. You'll hear more about these resources a little later. We hope you learned something new tonight and invite you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A or chat to send your questions to our speakers. We'll take your questions at the end of the program and we'll announce the winners of the Lifelong Learning Kentucky History Sweepstakes, so stay tuned. Carol, can you tell us a little about KHS and who the speakers are tonight? I will be glad to. Uh, so we are with the Kentucky Historical Society, which is uh, the state history, a statewide history organization. We are a part of Kentucky state government um, and we network with lots and lots of different uh, local uh, and regional history organizations in the area. Um, but we, uh, our mission is to educate and engage the public through Kentucky history to meet the challenges of the future. Um, so our speakers tonight, and I love showing off our wonderful staff, I love the people that I work with, uh, are Dr. Mandy Higgins and Krista Kiefer. Dr. Mandy Higgins is our Community Engagement Administrator, um, and she works with uh, local history organizations around the state um, to help them use their history um, in, in ways that help them to meet the challenges they face now and in the future. Krista is currently serving as our graduate um, <laughs> graduate editorial assistant, excuse me. Um, and she works with our scholarly publication, which is called the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society. So they are, I'm, I'm very grateful to them for sharing their expertise tonight. <clears throat> Thank you, Carol. Um, I will get started. I'm Mandy Higgins, as Carol said, uh, the Community Engagement Administrator at the Kentucky Historical Society. Um, and I have the, the distinct pleasure of talking to you tonight a little bit about um, Kentucky and the Civil Rights Movement. So I'll talk for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll have a, a little trivia question, and then Krista will talk about the war on poverty. So, um, I want to start out with just a couple of quick things about the civil rights movement in general. It is often bracketed from 1954, which is the Brown versus the Board of Education decision, to about 1968 with the assassination of Martin Luther King. Um, those dates help us think about um, and put time frames on something, but the movement itself started much earlier than the, the Brown decision and went on um, and continues today. But we're going to talk about a couple of instances in Kentucky during that time. Um, and then uh, a little bit about the reaction and how it relates to national perceptions of civil rights. Um, so we're gonna start in Sturgis, Kentucky, which is in far Western Kentucky. Um, and in Sturgis in 1956, the civil rights movement came to town, and if you will. Um, this picture is at 10th Street in Sturgis where the Kentucky National Guard is called in because uh, at the start of the regular school year, eight students attempted to desegregate Sturgis High School. Um, the students enrolled, believed that they could come to Sturgis High School, 
um, from the and not attend the African American school. But they were turned away at the school door on the first day of school on September 5th, 1956. Um, there, a, a group of folks joined um, protesters throughout the city. Uh, and the, on so that night, a group had to call the governor um, and ask for the National Guard to be activated because they feared violence and they didn't know what would happen. And that was negotiated with some of the parents who of the children who were trying to desegregate the school. They closed school on September 6th. And on September 7th, the students successfully entered school. Um, but there was violence. Uh, there were many arrests, the students felt danger in the classroom, and folks really did not react well to this. Um, white students then chose to boycott classes at Sturgis High School. Um, it was a school of about 300 and only 50 students showed up the following Monday when school resumed. Um, on top of that, the school board claimed that students had enrolled illegally because Union County had not developed a desegregation plan. So in 1954, um, through the Brown versus the board of Topeka, Kansas decision from the Supreme Court, schools were forced to create, were asked and then forced um, to create desegregation plans so that they were not operating separate and unequal schooling. Um, and they were given a timeline to do that. And so Union County had not produced a desegregation plan because they didn't feel pressure to do so. Um, the, so the school board ha not having a plan was not necessarily prepared for these students to enroll at Sturgis High School um, and try to forcibly des desegregate the school. So they reached out to the Kentucky Attorney General asking for the Attorney General to intervene because the students were acting illegally or outside the bounds of the school board. The Attorney General agreed um, and told the students that they had to attend the segregated school. It was called Dunbar. Um, this was a split decision because the governor at the time had uh, activated the National Guard to protect the students and to keep the peace in Sturgis. Uh, but the Attorney General, as you all know, is a constitutional officer and does not act within the executive branch, um, but in their own branch. And, the, um, and so his ruling stood that it was an illegal desegregation. The students, instead of returning to Dunbar, chose to complete the school year on correspondence, um, which I love to tell students about today um, as they're coming out of their forced quarantines and Zoom school that uh, eight students in Sturgis, Kentucky completed a year of school via correspondence classes through the mail um, long before there was the internet or anything like that. Um, so the students refused to accept that they were not able to be enrolled, would not go back to Dunbar um, and completed the year on correspondence and then they, in 1957, the school desegregated, the schools in Union County desegregated with little incidents. Um, I like to talk about Sturgis and I bring this up because this is happening before some of the massive resistance that we see in other Southern states. It's a moment um, where Kentucky is forced to, to think about and deal with some of the uh, issues that it, likes to um, downplay from the time. And it shows the ways that Kentucky is very involved in the civil rights movement. These local places are involved um, even when there are, um, it didn't get as much coverage or it didn't, la it didn't stay in our memory quite as long. What was happening in Sturgis in September of 1956 is making national headlines. Um, it should, it, People, it's reported in the New York Times. People are are coming into Sturgis to report on it, but it quickly dissipates um, because of the Attorney General's decision decision and the students' decision to accept correspondence classes. But it sets the stage for what's to come later in Kentucky's um, journey towards uh, better equality and uh, public accommodations um, for students and. 
Um, we see this then, so we're going to skip ahead about eight years. In the intervening years, there's a lot of local pressure. There's attempts to um, uh, to do a number of things um, along the way, and so there's building momentum for a push for a public accommodations bill. And this is happening alongside the national movement. And as you can see, um, we'll talk about some key figures now. Um, so that in, um, in March of 1964, there is a March on Frankfurt um, for a public accommodation. So if you've been to the state capitol in Frankfurt, Capitol Avenue is the street that leads up to the new Capitol. It's um, broad and wide. And on that street on March 5th, 1964, um, thousands of Kentuckians rallied to push the legislature to pass a public accommodations bill. Ooh. We went off, just a second. Um, this was a march that was locally led, but included national uh, figures. Frank Stanley Jr., who is on the bottom in the middle um, of this slide, was the publisher of the Louisville Defender, which was the African-American newspaper in Louisville. He'd been a strong advocate for desegregation, for expanded public accommodations, um, for equality before the law and in the way in social um, pieces. And he, working with Georgia Davis Powers, who would go on to become um, the first woman and the first African-American senator in Kentucky and May Street Kidd, one of the first women of color to be elected to the state house of representatives, uh, planned this large march. Um, and it looked a lot like the March on Washington, uh, banners and signs uh, addressing the legislature and the key figures, the two big public speeches were from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and from baseball great Jackie Robinson, um, who had a relationship with Kentucky, with a Kentuckian, though not much with Kentucky, um, through ha Governor Happy Chandler, who um, helped Robinson desegregate baseball. Um, they came to the Capitol, they came to Frankfurt to push for the state level public accommodations bill because these pieces, the um, the Civil Rights Act that I'm going to talk about in a second, the federal one had not passed yet. And so the push was for states to take up public accommodations, to take up a Civil Rights Act, um, to protect citizens within the state. At the time, they met with the governor um, who had called for this act in the legislature in 1964. But it did not pass. It was a failed attempt at the legislative uh, process, but it taught activists in Kentucky a lot. It helped to push um, the conversation forward. It drew again attention to what is seen as this upper South state that maybe is not uh, as in need of civil rights in some people's minds, though this is something, you know, it is very much a part of the work that needed to be done in the places that needed to be to it. And then we have, it helps launch some of the career, it helps give Georgia Davis powers a name. It, it, it solidifies May Street Kid um, as voices for equality and for pushing for um, expanded citizenship rights. As an aside, Senator Powers and Representative Kidd are um, instrumental in getting Kentucky to, to finally ratify the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the US Constitution. Um, they are ratified in 1977, so over a century after they were after they were ratified to the Constitution and made constitutional law. Um, Kentucky finally ratifies those in, in the late 70s, um, so getting a little bit outside of our bounds of remembering the 1960s, uh, but that is that continued legacy of the work that they're doing. So Dr. King, Jackie Robinson come to Frankfurt in March of 1964. They are pushing for public accommodations. They're picking up um, the arguments that were made at the March uh, in Washington for Jobs and Freedom um, in August of 1963. And they're working behind the scenes to push legislatures at the state and federal level to pass bills to 
protect the civil, to protect civil rights and to expand voting. Um, and that helps to set the stage so that in, Ju in July of 1964, the Civil Rights Act is passed. Um, and in August of 1965, the Voting Rights Act is passed. Um, so let's spend a little time just talking about the Federal Civil Rights Act. The Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964 bans discrimination in public accommodations. It protects um, folks from discrim discrimination regardless of race, sex, gender, or national origin. Um, it was a Herculean effort to get passed in the Senate, particularly it's, um, there was a filibuster for nearly 60 days. You've been hearing a lot about the filibuster lately. Um, this, is a, this is a bill that was filibustered for quite a long time. Um, and one of the, the provisions of the Civil Rights Act that is becomes incredibly important as it is picked up over the years um, is that it bans discrimination based on sex. Um, and this was actually inserted in the bill as a poison pill. Um, but civil rights activists thought that it was great and needed to be expanded because um, discrimination based on, on sex was um, a plank of the civil rights struggle, um, seeking equality meant seeking equality for all. And so um, this piece is that piece of the bill um, doesn't actually poison it, it strengthens it. Um, and it is eventually passed, uh, the filibuster fails um, and Johnson has his key piece of legislation in 1964. Um, this bill is also gets the Johnson treatment. If you know anything about Lyndon Baines Johnson, he, um, he is well known, he was well known as a, a politician for being a, um, being able to rally folks to his, his side in very persuasive ways um, through language and um, physical standing next to and sort of intimidation. Um, and he really took it under his watch um, after the death of, of uh, John F. Kennedy, the assassination of John Kennedy, who had first introduced this bill in the fall of 63, Johnson gets it passed um, with the, the strong backing and support of civil rights activists. He's being pushed in that direction. And he purportedly says, as he's signing the bill, that he signed away the South um, for a generation for the Democratic Party, but it was the work to do, that it needed um, this, this piece bringing citizenship to the vast majority of Americans and citizenship rights and protection of the law needed to happen. Um, but the Civil Rights Act does not address voting rights. And so a second bill is introduced in the legislature, in the federal legislature to protect voting rights, um, to end discrimination at the ballot box, to ban things like uh, a poll tax or a literacy test in order to vote. Um, that bill also faced a heavy lift and was filibustered, um, but was led and, and really gained momentum after the March on Selma. This is a, I like this picture because it's in color. So it's a, a nice reminder that that wasn't all that long ago that these things were happening. Um, the March on Selma is, was violent. Um, and that was, um, that gained attention in the ways that people were reacting against peaceful protesters. There's a very famous picture of um, John Lewis on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, um, having been hit by a baton and bleeding from his head um, that day. And then they come back and they march again and they, they march through Selma on to Birmingham. Um, and while Kentucky did not experience quite that piece of violence or that um, dramatic moment, the Voting Rights Act passage changes the ways that people interact and they vote. Um, it changes the, the push for voter registration. The Voting Rights Act um, required that states that had um, previously barred voting for any number of reasons if they wanted to make changes had to go before um, a, a review committee to do that which kept out some of the the bigger issues for a while 
um, it was eventually that section was eventually invalidated um, by the current court. Um, it prohibited discrimination in voting laws. It prohibited poll taxes. Those were very um, important pieces that also required things like bilingual ballots and um, equal access to um, to the ballot box. Um, it could it just, uh, made voter intimidation illegal. It didn't allow for those sorts of um, other ways that people were kept from voting. Um, Kentucky did not have a poll tax. It also did not explicitly ban African Americans from voting um, throughout the 20th century. But there are intimidation pieces. There were, it was hard to vote um, in a number of places. And so that Kentucky did not necessarily fall under the pre-clearance or the results um, questions of the of the Voting Rights Act, but it did um, impact the way that Kentuckians voted and the access to the ballot box. Um, and, and that piece still lives with us. So with the federal laws in place, um, it reverted again to the states to think about how the states would be protecting um, folks from discrimination, particularly in public accommodations and in private businesses. And so in Kentucky, um, that march on Frankfurt in 1964 failed to pass some, have a Civil Rights Act pass in the 64 legislature, but it was brought up again in the 1966 session um, and it passed. Kentucky became the first state to pass a statewide Civil Rights Act in the South, so the first Southern state to do so. Um, the act bans discrimination in public accommodations and private businesses, um, so it, it provides state level teeth to the Civil Rights Act, even though federal law trumps state law. Um, and it also expanded that to private businesses so that um, that discrimination cannot exist um, within private businesses. And it established the Human Rights Commission, which can, the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights still exists today. Its sole job is to make sure that there are, that um, state, that individuals, businesses and states and state actor in, in Kentucky are acting um, within the bounds of the Civil Rights Act. And that includes uh, making sure that folks are not being discriminated against because of age, um, ability, race, gender, um, sexual orientation, uh, their, their role is to make sure that we are all living up to those, those pieces and that we are creating and um, fostering equality in the state. Uh, they do a number of other things. There's a, a hall of fame. Um, they, they promote history. They do some really great work, um, but they are an agency of state government and they are there to, to work with you. Um, particularly around um, issues of discrimination um, based on um, identity pieces like age, race, those sorts of things. The 66 Civil Rights Act, again, reinforced the federal right, the Federal Civil Rights Act. Uh, it was an important piece for Kentucky to show that momentum towards being a place of equality. Um, and it is, um, it is still the law today. Now, while all of this is seen as um, this was all presented in sort of a rosy light, I do want to talk a little bit about the perceptions of the civil rights movement in Kentucky um, and nationally. Civil rights movement is often um, retrospectively seen as being a very positive thing that people across the country supported. It's not entirely true. Um, folks were the advances that occurred during civil rights movements met, met strong backlash. Um, for many people, um, it was scary and intimidating. There was fear of change. There was racism um, and sexism thrown at folks. In Kentucky, some of the um, most public times that we saw this backlash occurred in Louisville. Um, there are three or four incidents, but I'll talk about two. Um, one was around housing. Louisville was a, um, a city that had been redlined, which was a practice by 
mortgage lenders um, in the federal government to segregate neighborhoods based on where you could get a mortgage. And Louisville is a particularly red line city. And although it is unconstitutional and it continued to occur, the restrictive covenants and just not giving loans and other things like that. And so um, in the late 1950s, uh, Anne and Carl Braden, who were white um, newspaper workers, they were in a newspaper and were educators, uh, bought a home in Shively for um, on behalf of the Wade family and African American family who were looking to move to Shively, the Shively neighborhood. And um, that was met with quite a bit of resistance and violence. The home was bombed while the Wades were in it. Um, and while the Wades were, were safe, the home was basically destroyed um, and they left Louisville. So that's one example of the um, sort of the backlash to it. The other actually happened outside of the 60s and some of you may remember this, the, um, the protests against busing, which is a direct result of the Brown versus the Board of Education decision in 1954. Um, Louisville's public schools, uh, were not um, meeting the requirements of desegregation. And one of the ways that the city chose to create um, access to education and um, to meet that desegregation piece was um, to bus, to create a busing plan. Louisville's not the only city. Boston buses a number of Northern cities choose busing as a way to um, desegregate their public schools. And in Louisville, there was quite a bit of protest to that busing plan. Um, the Kentucky Historical Society actually has a, a small collection of some of the anti-busing literature, and it includes a, a record of an anti-busing busing song, which is very interesting. A um, little piece of ephemera from the period. Um, and today we're starting to see that that busing plan maybe didn't work the way that it was intended to work. Um, there was a really long piece uh, series in um, the Courier Journal in the spring about um, how it started and where it's and how it sort of fell apart and where it is now. So that backlash came um, because of the change, it helped to solidify some of the positions and the need for what was happening, but it also um, led to other challenges that uh, cities had to face, um, the state continues to face. And so those pieces um, help us to think about and to know um, where struggles were, where they, they continue. Uh, Kentucky has a very uh, rich history of activists working to bring equality to the state um, and has to balance that with the, you know, these images of some of the backlash and the concern, um, some of it rooted in, in, you know, just a fear, but a lot of it rooted in a distrust and a, and a unwillingness to accept um, difference, something that was not what they wanted. And so, uh, we're, we're that moment in that that civil rights moment in Kentucky is one of both um, triumph and of concern, um, and so you know we see this and we see that to continue in the ways that um, some cities are are laid out and the opportunities that are there. And so as much as we want to, many of us want to believe that the civil rights movement. Um, ended in 1968 or ended with the passage of the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Act, um, that work continued um, and it's still part of um, where we are today. Um, and we're gonna take questions at the end. Yes, there are a number and they're good. Um, yes, I think we will take questions at the end. Is that right, Anisha? And Jackie. Yes, okay. ma'am. Yes, we will. All right. And, okay. All right. Well, um, I that's sort of the end of my piece here, but I'm going to think about those questions and hand it back over to Carol. Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, I, I didn't tell you much about Mandy before we got started because I skipped right over that in my um, order of the program here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mandy does have a PhD in American history from the University of Kentucky. And um, 
she mentioned John Lewis as part of her presentation tonight. And one of the really cool things that she got to do when she was working on her dissertation was actually to interview John Lewis about the time that he spent working with uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, down there in, in Alabama. So um, she's gotten to do some really awesome research. But I have, before we move on to our next speaker, I've got a little, I got a little 60s Kentucky trivia for you here. Um, so before we, before we move on, let's see if you can identify this famous Kentuckian. You can put your guesses in the chat if you, if you've got, a, if you've got one there. Um, so born this day, in, born on this day, November 2nd in 1734, the adventures of this famous Kentuckian inspired a popular TV show that premiered in the fall of 1964. The series ran for six seasons on NBC before being canceled in 1970. All right, so Nelda has a guest there. Anybody else? I guess not. Well, congrats, Nelda, you are correct. Um, I'm sure many of you remember watching uh, Daniel Boone on TV. Um, there we, yes, Mark, you're correct as well. Um, it still impacts the way that the, the kind of popular perceptions of who Daniel Boone actually was, um, even though the program itself was, was not exactly faithful to the historical record. They took some pretty, uh, pretty creative license there, um, though it was entertaining, of course. Um, yeah, Daniel Boone definitely didn't wear a coonskin cap, but it's okay. Uh, I think that I think that was actually a leftover from Fess Parker's role as Davy Crockett. So um, let's see. Dana says Fess Parker played Daniel Boone and went on to have an award-winning winery in California. Good for him. I'll have to try. I'll have to try some of that wine if it's still being made. Um, all right. Well, we will um, move on to our second speaker, uh, Krista Kiefer, who I mentioned uh, before is working at right now as a graduate editorial assistant here at the Kentucky Historical Society. Uh, the editor of the register, Stephanie Lang, is, I know, very appreciative of the work that Krista is doing right now. Uh, very helpful. Krista, I just found out, is actually not a native Kentuckian. She's from Memphis. Um, argue with her about barbecue because she has opinions. But um, she is currently studying at the University of Kentucky, and she will soon be Dr. Krista Keeper. Um, she is working uh, on a PhD in American history. Her specialty is modern American politics, particularly the rise of modern conservatism. So uh, she's going to be talking with us about uh, the war on poverty here in Kentucky in the 1960s. Take it away, Krista. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and it's really fitting that uh, we kind of discussed the civil rights movement before this, uh, because the war on poverty, uh, it, it's like the civil rights movement, it's really hard to define, hard to book in, um, and some of that's kind of intentional. Um, but uh, it really comes out of the fervor of the civil rights movement. And individuals such as Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, as we heard about, uh, really contributed significantly to the beginning of the modern struggle for civil rights and brought racial discrimination uh, to the nation's attention, really. Uh, and, and this really caused young Americans, both black and white, uh, to ask how these problems could exist within their country. The United States had just defeated fascism. Uh, it now stood as a guarantor uh, of freedom and democracy against the communist threat in the 1960s. Uh, and its economy, moreover, generated more wealth than any other country. Uh, so really these two issues, poverty and discrimination, uh, because they directly countered those sources of confidence, uh, they became really the new enemies and they become the focal point uh, of the nation. Uh, and uh, anti-poverty activities really swept up large numbers of African Americans and they built on the accomplishments and disappointments of the Civil Rights Movement and the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964, uh, which we'll talk about a little more in a minute. Uh, it, it has a call for maximum feasible participation by the poor, and, and this really grows out of the mass civil rights movements uh, and mobilizations of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and um, 
these, you know, they won the basic political rights for African Americans, mainly across the South. Uh, but there was a, a, a sort of feeling that uh, there was still more to do. And that uh, really the next logical step was to fight for economic justice uh, and uh, kind of continue the movement on. And then uh, more so beyond that, um, you, you really see that there, there's kind of one figure, one uh, person that's maybe more influential than any other single person in kind of drawing the nation's attention towards the issue of poverty. Uh, and, and that's an author, political activist, and professor of political science, Michael Harrington, who wrote a book called The Other America, which was published in 1962. Uh, and, and he kind of exposed what he called the nation's invisible problem, which was poverty. And, and he really showed that it could be kind of buried in cities under skyscrapers, or it could be hidden behind mountains in what he called forgotten regions, which included Appalachia in his mind. Uh, and, and through all this, he argued that around 50 million Americans uh, were kind of within the grips of poverty. Um, and this book was really influential to many people, but it was really influential to uh, some powerful people in particular, like John F. Kennedy. Uh, and John F. Kennedy uh, was really moved by this book and it drew his attention not only to the issue of poverty, but to Appalachia specifically. Uh, so it was really influential to him. It really got JFK's uh, kind of fervor for uh, anti-poverty initiatives started. Um, and not only that, uh, President Johnson's appeals to uh, anti-poverty legislation uh, really answered another need that uh, many Americans felt for less materialism and more kind of a spirituality within the nation. Uh, many people felt that the consumerism and the, the private absorptions of the 50s had left uh, the country feeling somewhat jaded and many people were really hungry for kind of renewed political crusades. Uh, and John F. Kennedy's popularity had spanned partly, uh, it, it, it had kind of uh, spurred forth partly because of his idealistic calls for self-sacrifice uh, that would advance the country and the world towards what he saw as more noble dreams for greater equality and justice uh, for everyone within the nation. Uh, and, and Americans had advocated throughout their history uh, for many of these things, but uh, had fallen short and Johnson had, and Kennedy had said uh, that, no, we can actually achieve uh, these things. And, and uh, Johnson kind of spurs on and, and tacks on to uh, Kennedy's vision after his assassination and his push for anti-poverty crusades, quite frankly, was just really popular and resonated with the national sentiment. Uh, and in the first half of 1964, the country gave him consistent approval ratings of around 75%. And only about 10% showed any doubts at all to his job performance or his policies. So, um, you know, not only has the nation's attention been drawn to poverty uh, through Michael Harrington's book and uh, kind of the crusade for, for civil rights, um, but it's just a popular movement in general. The nation was really excited about large scale political movements like this. So it was popular politically for Johnson to do this. Uh, so it made a lot of sense uh, for him to institute a, a war on poverty. So now that the scene is kind of set here, and, and we kind of know why this is going on. Uh, let's look at what exactly was the war on poverty. And like I mentioned earlier, this is something that's kind of hard to define, uh, kind of hard to book in uh, and say, look, it begins here and ends here. It's really not that simple. Um, the, many of the things that were instituted in the war on poverty shift, changed over time, ended, some of them are very much still intact and going on today. Um, but where most people kind of agree the, the war on poverty officially uh, begins is with the State of the Union address on January 8th of 1964 uh, by Lyndon Johnson, uh, where he stated that the nation and his administration was declaring unconditional war on poverty in America. Uh, but of course, it takes a little bit of time for uh, the legislative wheels to kind of get turning here. And it's not until August 20th of 1964 
that any legislation is, is really passed. Um, and at that time, Congress passes the Economic Opportunity Act, which is really uh, the bedrock legislation for the war on poverty. Um, and it was kind of noted to be a measure designed to mobilize the human and financial resources of the nation uh, to combat poverty uh, within the United States. Um, and the act declared uh, that it was the policy of the United States to eliminate the paradox of poverty in the midst of plenty in this nation by opening to everyone the opportunity for education and training, the opportunity to work, and the opportunity to live in decency and dignity. Um, so quite frankly, it's a bit vague here. There, there's of course kind of an idea, um, but it kind of lays out a few of the things it's gonna focus on, job training, education, these things. Uh, and, and the Economic Opportunity Act uh, was really an experimental package and it kind of ends up resting on five key pillars. Uh, and those are job training, community action, volunteerism, uh, incentives for business to hire particularly hard hit or stigmatized groups, and the coordination of these efforts under the watchful eye of the Office of Economic Opportunity. And uh, it, in addition to being kind of experimental, it's got a relatively small appropriation of under $1 billion when it's first passed. Um, so the administration is going to have to kind of get a bit creative in how it institutes some of this and how it achieves and follow the, follows those uh, five key pillars. Um, but some of the major things uh, that the uh, Economic Opportunity Act does are, first it proposes the creation of a job corps, uh, which is really heavily modeled after the Civilian Conservation Corps of the Great Depression era. Uh, the job corps was really a residential education and job training program for low, uh, low income at risk young people uh, that provided them with academic and vocational skills, uh, which they would need to uh, attain meaningful employment later. Um, uh, another thing is it instituted work uh, training and work study programs, which are all aimed at giving impoverished young people the opportunity to complete their education, as well as develop soluble skills uh, that they could use later. Uh, it asks for funding for VISTA, uh, which is the Volunteers in Service to America, which is really a domestic Peace Corps of types uh, made for those kind of ready to enlist in this war against poverty. Um, it outlined a community action program, which would give every American community the opportunity to develop a comprehensive plan to fight its own poverty. So um, they would get to choose and point out uh, what areas they could best deal with or where they most needed help. So the communities would have a lot of say in, in what kind of programs uh, their communities would get or institute. And uh, the federal government would help them carry them out. Um, it proposed a loan program to provide incentives for those to hire the unemployed. And then last, of course, it makes the Office of Economic Opportunity to kind of coordinate all of this as stated before. Um, so you'll see that most of this um, is not social wel welfare programs, despite how the war on poverty is mainly remembered. And the reason it's mainly remembered as uh, kind of social welfare policies and not things like work programs is because actually some of its uh, most well-known and most useful programs were social welfare policies, namely uh, the Social Security Amendments of 1965, which created Medicare and Medicaid and expanded Social Security benefits for retirees, widows, the disabled, and even college-age students. Um, so this is probably the most well-remembered uh, war on poverty uh, initiative. Uh, there were examples of others like the Food Stamp Act of 1964, which made the food stamps program uh, permanent. At the time, it was really only a pilot program not designed to be permanent, uh, but it gets made permanent. So there were uh, kind of social welfare programs coupled with many uh, work and training programs. That was kind of the meat of the war on poverty. And once these kind of get going, and once these kind of get uh, developed. The next question is really, well, where are we going to most institute these uh, and where are these going to be most helpful? And uh, kind of very early on, um, it gets decided that 
Appalachia is the place where uh, most of the weeds are going to be instituted most heavily. And really some of the most famous images from the war on poverty uh, that you'll frequently see come from Appalachia uh, because uh, President Johnson kind of used it as the poster child and he took uh, multiple visits there. Uh, and up on top of the screen here, you can kind of see two photos of uh, his visit uh, to Appalachia. Uh, but the, the roots for anti-poverty initiatives in Appalachia are a bit deeper. Uh, down here, you can see JFK. Uh, he came on a visit to Appalachia in 1958. Uh, so very early on, he comes to Appalachia as well, trying to promote some of his anti-poverty initiatives. Um, so uh, Appalachia comes to the forefront really quickly. Um, and it's really a natural battleground for the war on poverty, uh, not only because it harbored some of the poorest counties in the United States, uh, but it had also just long held the interest of reformers. Of course, in the late 1890s, uh, there was the local color movement, which was a literary movement that highlighted some of the uh, uh, tough living conditions in some of the more remote sections of Appalachia, uh, where they developed settlement schools that were kind of modeled after some of the more well-known urban counterparts, like the whole house in uh, Chicago. And um, uh, they kind of model these initiatives off of the more well-known ones and then bring national attention to Appalachia very early on in the late 1890s. Um, so Appalachia had already been the subject of reformers uh, kind of interest uh, for a long time. Uh, but more importantly, really, in the 1960s, quite frankly, one in three Appalachians uh, lived in poverty. And uh, per capita income in the Appalachian region was about 23% uh, lower than US average. Uh, and, and high unemployment forced millions to seek work outside of Appalachia. And here you can see a map that's become kind of famous. Uh, and it's kind of a map you'll always see uh, when a discussion of the war on poverty comes up. And basically, this is a map from 1960. And it's showing poverty rates as compared to the US average, and it's breaking it down by county. And if it's red, it's above the, uh, or it's below the, the uh, people's income is below the national average. Uh, and the darker the red, the higher above it is. And you can see pretty much every single county below the Northern border of West Virginia and Kentucky is 150 to 350% percent uh, higher, the poverty rate is higher uh, than the US average. And then every single uh, one of the counties is higher than the average, but the overwhelming majority are 150 to 350% higher. So significantly higher. So it makes sense uh, at this point to direct some uh, uh, poverty relief to the region, right? Um, so, uh, in 1963, uh, President John F. Kennedy uh, created the President's Appalachian Regional Commission. Um, and uh, this was really to prepare a comprehensive uh, action program for economic development uh, within the region. Uh, and this work gets continued by John F. Kennedy or by uh, Lyndon Johnson, rather. He, he uses a PARC report as the basis uh, for legislation. Uh, and, and he uh, ends up asking Congress to provide uh, special aid to Appalachia for his war on poverty. Um, and, and eventually, uh, passed by Congress in 1965, uh, the Appalachian Regional Development Act uh, creates the Appalachian Regional Commission, uh, which is gonna oversee the economic development in the region and it's going to oversee the construction of the Appalachian Development Highway System, which is uh, really indicative of what the War on Poverty wanted to do nationally, uh, but particularly uh, what the uh, Appalachian Regional Commission wanted to do in Appalachia, which was focus on infrastructure. Again, many of the uh, programs from the War on Poverty were also infrastructure programs. So most of the ones that you will see in uh, Appalachia are building roads, uh, building bridges, and building dams. 
uh, those are kind of the main programs and, and the, um, uh, the highway program is one of the biggest and most important ones. Uh, not only that though, the Appalachian Regional Development Act also for the first time uh, politically actually defines Appalachia. Uh, and, and it lists uh, Kentucky and parts of 12 other states like West Virginia, Alabama, Georgia, Maryland, et cetera, as part of the Appalachian region. And it doesn't uh, actually follow the Appalachian Mountains all that specifically, sometimes it strays from them, but Appalachia gets defined politically for the first time. Um, now, again, it is difficult to uh, bookend a lot of this and say when it began, when it ended, there's an argument uh, that it's still uh, going on today that the, that the war on poverty is still happening. Many seem to say it ends uh, during Bill Clinton's presidency when he pushes through some uh, uh, welfare reform that shuts down a lot of what the war on poverty was doing. Uh, despite that, it's fair at this point, we're about 55 years out from the war on poverty. It's fair to assess its uh, successes and failures uh, and to see what it actually did. Um, and uh, quite frankly, when you just look at the statistics, in the decade following 1964, uh, poverty rates in the U.S. dropped to their lowest level since comprehensive records began in 1958. And when you look at the Appal Appalachian region in particular, uh, you can see a significant gain here. Um, so you can see that map from 1960 earlier, and then here we have the map. Uh, from 2008 and 2012. Now, you can see that there still are a lot of counties that are in uh, what would be called a distressed condition, but it, it is significantly better uh, than the map from the 1960s, that there has been at least some ground made here, uh, most people will admit. Now, it gets interesting when you look at some of the national figures and start breaking them down uh, a little more. Uh, you can see here uh, that poverty rates have decreased. Uh, the one on the top is the sheer number of people in poverty. The one on the bottom is uh, uh, the poverty rate. And you see there has been a decline. Now the number of people in poverty at times has gone up, of course, with the Great Recession uh, in 2008. There's a spike, uh, things like this, but uh, there, there's no doubt, too, that around 1964, there is a significant drop. Uh, so many proponents of the war on poverty and supporters of the war on poverty uh, will point to this and say, well, no, there has generally been a decline. Um, not only that, there's a sharp decline when the war on poverty, uh, you know, gets underway. Um, now, opponents will point to something kind of interesting sometimes, which is that if you look at this graph over time, uh, the downward trend actually begins before the war on poverty. So some opponents will say, look, the poverty was just on decline uh, to begin with. Uh, so uh, some people will point to that, uh, that are opponents. Uh, now, it, it gets a bit even more interesting when you break it down even further by, for instance, age group. So uh, poverty among Americans between ages 18 and 64 really only fell marginally since uh, 1966 from 10.5% 10 to about 10.1%. So really in, in the age bracket of 18 to 64, which is a quite large age bracket, uh, there was really only a marginal decline uh, in poverty rates. Uh, but poverty has significantly fallen among Americans under 18 years old from 23% in 1964 down to 17. Uh, now, sometimes it has spiked back up in the 20% uh, range, but still generally there's been a pretty significant decline uh, in poverty rates among people uh, 18 and younger. Now, uh, the uh, most significant group uh, and the most dramatic decrease in poverty was among Americans over 65, which fell from 28.5% in 1966 to 10.1% uh, generally, uh, about a decade ago that statistics pulled from. Um, so uh, it, 
when you break it down by age range, uh, there are areas where, well, the war on poverty was more successful uh, than others. And opponents will say, see, look, it only had a marginal effect on specific age groups. And proponents of the war on poverty would say, well, those were the age groups that fell more under our policies. It was more so directed at people under the age of 18, more of our programs were, and people 65 and older. Uh, so uh, proponents will point to that and say, look, where we were allowed to uh, push our policies most heavily, it was most successful. Uh, and then the final, and maybe one of the more interesting uh, trends that was pointed out in The Economist in the 50 year anniversary of the war on poverty is that even though uh, Appalachia has gotten richer, it's gotten sicker. Uh, so as poverty rates have decreased, mortality rates in Appalachia uh, have actually increased over time uh, as compared to the national average. Uh, and some people account this to uh, some rising health issues like diabetes, for instance, that has spiked since the 1960s, um, an outflow of young people. Uh, things like this have led to kind of a widening gap with the rest of the country in terms of mortality rates, um, which again, health programs are huge for the war on poverty. Uh, so some people will point to this and say, well, uh, some of the health programs like Medicaid and Medicare uh, were another failure if the mortality rates are increasing. Uh, proponents will point to and say, no, look, there's other trends like rising health issues, like, again, diabetes is the big one uh, that many will point to, uh, that the rise of these health issues has caused this uh, kind of widening uh, mortality spike. Um, so nonetheless, with, with all the debate over whether uh, the War on Poverty was a successful program and what its effects on uh, the nation or Appalachia specifically were, um, uh, it's undoubted that this is an important program to look towards because as you can see by these maps what, where there, uh, whether you know, there has been a decrease in poverty, uh, there's still widespread poverty in the region and there is rising mortality rates. So uh, whether it was successful or not, this is a program that's really important to kind of take a look back to, uh, try to evaluate some of its successes and failures so we can move forward and continue to try to uh, solve some of these issues rather than dig our head in the sand, right? Um, so it's important to look back at some of these issues uh, of the 1960s uh, and, and how they dealt with them then to see how we can continue to move forward. Uh, and progress. Thank you. I want to thank both of our speakers tonight for the wonderful history lesson. Now we'll take your questions. If you have a question for either of our speakers, send them in now. Type it in chat or submit it with the Q&A button on your screen. I believe we have some in chat. Yeah, there are a couple um, addressed to meet, so I can start, and then there are a couple for you too, Krista. So um, we had a question if we, uh, when you're talking about the filibuster, is it as we know it as a talking filibuster? Um, after 1917, the filibuster really changed and was really about cloture, which is about getting to the point where you can vote and, and debate. So in 1964, um, the filibuster, there was some talking, Robert Byrd, very uh, West Virginia Senator, very famously spoke for 14 hours. Um, at the end of the, the filibuster, the 60 day filibuster, um, but cloture was reached um, then. So it was not a full talking filibuster. It was a filibuster of um, not getting to a vote to end debate. Um, the members of the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights are appointed by district, and then there are at-large appointments, and there are, the governor gets to appoint those openings, but they overlap gubernatorial um, pieces. There's a question about federal money provided to Jefferson County to implement busing. Um, it was actually the reverse. Federal money would be lost 
if a true desegregation plan was not put in place by 1974. Um, busing is still practiced in Jefferson County. It's gone through a number of different iterations and then um, was ruled unconstitutional in the early 2000s in a case that I can't remember what it's called, um, but it's still practiced as one way to reach um, a racially equitable quota across Jefferson County schools. Um, other methods were used um, in a lot of other Kentucky counties that aren't nearly as large as Jefferson County um, to just, you know, there's one high school. So you close the segregated African-American school and you integrate or desegregate is a better term there, the, um, the white school. And so uh, I, Jackie told us earlier, she's from Hopkinsville. There's a pretty famous story about Attucks closing and then coming into Hopkinsville High School. We worked with some of the graduates of Attucks um, about five years ago and it was really great. Um, so that was the more common uh, piece was that the most counties and had a county high school and maybe a city high school um, and the um, segregated schools would, the black schools were closed and the, the white schools were then desegregated with the students from the African-American schools. Krista, I think there are questions for you. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll look at a few of these and, and uh, hopefully some of you stumped me here, let's see. Um, that one here, it says, uh, do you think the Soviet threat added to the push uh, to focus on poverty? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the Cold War is not just important with the war on poverty, but the civil rights movement as well. Uh, it's kind of a PR disaster for the United States when they're saying, look how great we are, look how much better we are than the Soviets. And then they point to how many African-Americans are treated in many regions in the country. They point to areas in the United States where people are struggling. Uh, for the very basic necessities and they're saying look uh you aren't that great right look how the american system is working it's not working for everybody etc so yeah that brings it kind of uh to the forefront um and then a few more about appalachia what's working well today to fight poverty in appalachia well i think the issue uh is still poverty but it's also changing more like you see that map to the mortality rates health care uh, issues surrounding health. Um, so uh, they're kind of pushing in that direction to try to find ways to help with the opioid crisis right now, uh, to help with issues like diabetes. Uh, so uh, you're seeing more uh, kind of healthcare institutions pop up, uh, trying to increase access to healthcare within the region. Um, some of those, those uh, infrastructural improvements, I believe there's a highway that's just now getting widened again uh, out there. Uh, so um, some of these things do increase uh, resources and infrastructure, particularly healthcare, uh, will probably be moving in the right direction uh, today. Um, and then was mining the largest industry uh, in the 60s? I don't know, but I would guess that it was. Uh, particularly in the 60s, there was kind of this last spike for mining industry, uh, where it kind of did its last increase uh, before it started to kind of uh, nosedive again uh, slowly uh, and, and until where we see it uh, kind of dropping more and more faster and faster today. Uh, but yeah, I would imagine it, it was one of the larger uh, in, uh, larger industries, but also one of the more well-paying ones in the uh, area. And I believe that's it. Okay. Any other questions? Um, there is the question of if integration is the same as desegregation. Not quite. Um, so integration presumes an equality um, that, uh, that you have truly integrated um, or brought together difference in the society. Um, and we've not quite reached that. Desegregation remove, is the idea of removing the barrier and so you've you've ended segregation. You've kept um, the bar You've taken the barrier apart. But integration would be a, a truer um, coming together. And so we used integration um, a lot in the ways that we talked about civil rights history. Uh, 
well into the early 2000s that the historians have picked up deseger desegregation as the true as a better descriptor word um, to tell us what was happening because that helps us also think about the ways that certain parts of the the society and the country have not um, reached that goal of integration but they have desegregated that was my question thank you well, thank you for submitting your questions. Now we're going to hear from Jackie about AARP Kentucky Comebackers. Hello, everybody. I'm Jackie White. Um, I feel like I'm sitting in a history class and uh, that I participated in everything because I remember most of what we've been talking about. I was a kid, but I still remember it. Um, I want to uh, talk just a minute about... Uh, the lifelong learning. <clears throat> I'm going to be uh, sharing some resources to help you start your comeback if you want to restart uh, your life plan for education. Oftentimes, life just sort of gets in the way, and it can be difficult to do everything that we want to do. And uh, right now, there are three pathways in Kentucky that are opportunities to help you advance your education and your career. The first pathway over on the left, the first column where it says number one, it has resources to help you earn your GED. For those of you that couldn't finish high school for some reason, Kentucky Skills U offers free adult education services in all 120 counties. GED Plus can allow you to earn a GED and a technical certificate at the same time. You may want to be able to take the GED test. Uh, I mean, you may be able to take that GED test right now free while the funding lasts, because right now it doesn't cost anything in most cases. The second pathway, that's number two, that column, includes resources for adults who want to earn a certificate or an associate's degree. With Work Ready Kentucky, you may qualify to earn up to 60 college credits tuition free if you already have your high school diploma or your GED. Now Donovan Fellowship, which falls in the second and third columns, actually applies to associate degrees and above, including bachelor's and graduate level degrees. If you are 65 or older, you may qualify for a tuition waiver to take courses and or work toward a degree tuition free with that Donovan Fellowship. Now, the key to that is 65 or older. That one's probably going to be free and it's called Donovan Fellowship. Lastly, in addition to the Donovan Fellowship in the third pathway, you have a resource to help you finish a degree that you've already started. If you have previously earned 80 or more college credits at a four-year institution in Kentucky, there may be a degree completion option available with Project Graduate at your institution. You can visit aarp.org slash kycomebackers to find all of this information, aarp.org slash kycomebackers. You can find this information, learn more, and determine what matches your own goals. Follow the links to the program websites or call to see if you're eligible for your desired program. Back to you, Dana. You're muted, Dana. <laughs> You're muted, Dana. <laughs> okay. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jackie. Before we wrap up, are we ready to see our giveaway winners? Drum roll. Deborah, I think you may have some uh, the the drawings, the list, yeah, <laughs> the the drawings or the list.
I'm going to tell our winners that um, you're going to receive an email from AARP tomorrow. So please be on the lookout for that email. Deborah, we can't hear you if you could um, unmute. unmute. <laughs> We're all learning that lesson tonight. <laughs> There we go. Robert Braverman, Joan Fitzsimmons, Stephen Morgan, Donna Anderson, Andrea Allen, Gerard Weigel, Julie Kelly, John Strebel, Sheila Stoke, Lee Carroll, Andra Adams, Emily Hudson, James Shings, Judy Jackson, and Marlene Frost. They are our winners. Oh, great. We've got the list now. Right. Congratulations. It's great. Um, do you have, a, does anybody have a, a picture of the prize? I don't have anything handy. Nope. Okay. <laughs> so it's going to be a surprise. Well, it's a very nice gift. So, but I don't have a picture of it. So. Uh, do we have their email? I think we have the email addresses from their registration. Yes, we should have your email from the registration. Okay, so, so we'll be if, contacting if you're, you. If you're a winner, look for an email tomorrow from AARP just to double check your email address. This is the first one we've done, so we have to get the bugs out with you guys. But <laughs> you gave a lot of uh, door prizes away on this one since you're having to suffer through it with us. <laughs> <laughs> Trial and error. <laughs> Uh, I noticed Scott put the uh, uh, Kentucky Comebackers on Twitter. You can follow us there. And then he's got another link, too. So congratulations to our winners. We hope you all join us for our next event in this series. Remember, we've got three. This was the first of three. Inspiring Stories from the Bluegrass. Our guest speaker, Steve Flaherty, who is a former teacher and author who writes about everyday heroes from Kentucky, and has an abundance of inspiring stories of Kentuckians throughout history. You can still register for that session and our third session, which will really be interesting on family history, by visiting aarp.cventcvent.com backslash Kentucky Lifelong Learning. You, you should see it on the screen. AARP also has an upcoming event for caregivers on November 13th. Speakers will discuss 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's, dealing with stress, and more topics of importance. The link to register is on the screen and also in chat. Carol, would you like to share any upcoming events with Kentucky History Society, KHS? Thank you. Yes, I, I would love to. Um, one event that's coming up later this week uh, is our monthly First Friday Speaker Series. Um, so if lecture style events are some, like this are something that you enjoy, um, you may want to check out our, our, our upcoming events. Um, the First Friday Speaker Series is free for members of KHS. It's $5 for, for anybody um, who's not a member. Right now it is a completely virtual series. We're working out how we might be able to kind of make it a hybrid in-person and virtual uh, event as things get safer. Uh, but our speaker uh, this particular Friday is going to be Dr. Dana Kaldemeyer. Um, she is a professor of history at um, South Georgia State College, and she's recently published a book um, about, um, it's called Union Renegades, and it's about um, minors and unionizing in, in sort of the Gilded Age. Um, so interesting um, sort of Kentucky connections. I had hoped we'd get her around Labor Day, and of course she was already booked, but we're hearing lots about labor issues right now and uh, the great resignation uh, that we're experiencing at the moment. So still a timely talk, um, even uh, after Labor Day. Um, so that's coming up on Friday. It starts at noon. Um, we also are really excited to have um, a brand new exhibit opening on November 11th. Um, we will be open that evening. Frankfurt celebrates our candlelight event uh, that evening, which is kind of the start of the holiday season. But Illuminations is the name of the exhibit, um, and it focuses on the history of, of light in Kentucky, natural light, artificial light, how Kentuckians have used it and created it, 
Um, I'm really excited. It's going to be fascinating. So um, check us out this Friday for First Friday. Come see us on November 11th and check out our new exhibit, Illuminations. Oh, and one more. Um, as part, as in celebration of the new Illuminations exhibit, River City Tintypes from Louisville is going to be with us on Saturday, uh, November 13th, all day. You can get a tintype done. Wow. Um, if you like old photographs, like looking at them, you can get a tintype done of yourself. Um, uh, I had one done uh, just recently, and it's it's pretty awesome, um, if I do say so myself. But uh, they posted it to KHS social media today, uh, as well as a couple of my other colleagues that had them done as well. So check those out. Consider coming and getting a tintype on Saturday the 13th. We would love to see you. Uh, thank you all very much. Mandy had to step out, had to put the kids to bed, but uh, she wanted me to thank you all uh, for, for having her having us uh, with you all tonight. Thank you. That concludes tonight's event, but don't forget we've got two more next Tuesday and the following Tuesday. We hope you enjoyed it and welcome your feedback. You'll receive a link to a survey in the next few days. Please let us know about your experience. Thank you for participating and thanks again to our speakers. Have a good night and hope to see you in the following two Tuesdays. Good night.